place for stay tuned a welcome back let's go all the way to almaty in kazakhstan where we're being joined virtually by professor dennis soltis who is uh, uh, of the Department of Public Administration and International Development at the Kimap University. Thank you so much for your time. Good morning uh, to you. I'm not actually sure it's morning, but uh, a good day to you. And how is it this morning that, uh, in, in Almaty? Uh, good day. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me, first of all. Do you hear me? <laughs> That's right. Uh, now, uh, yes, I can hear you. I can hear you loud and clear. Well, it's nice and sunny here. It's a wonderful day. Well, it, 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 it's a bit drizzly here, but uh, in, I'm sure in Ukraine, um, the situation and what is happening there has uh, impact on Kazakhstan. First of all, uh, what, what's been the general reaction uh, to this uh, 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 situation in uh, Ukraine? by uh, Kazakhs uh, insofar as you can establish them? Uh, well, I think society is divided. The younger generation is more pro-Ukraine and pro-Western. Uh, older people are, you know, uh, take the Russian line more. Well, uh, Russia, Russia is quite friendly. Russia is uh, in many in many ways uh, a very friendly country to Kazakhstan uh, as it is with uh, the other countries described as stands. But then Ukraine also is uh, one of, uh, of the friends. So that puts Kazakhstan in a difficult position uh, between the two uh, uh, combatants, if you like. But what, generally speaking, in terms of geopolitics in the area, uh, let's start with the food crisis, for example. Uh, do you think Kazakhstan might be affected by this? Uh, well, first of all, Kazakhstan's relations with Russia are more important than with Ukraine, so their interests lie that way. Kazakhstan, of course, is a major food-producing uh, country, uh, produces a lot of wheat, so uh, if uh, you know, railways or transport could be found, then uh, you know, I'm sure they would, uh, they would export grain. What do you think about the war situation in Ukraine itself? Um, Russia says that, uh, you know, it needed to provide for its own security. Ukraine is saying that it's a sovereign country and should be able to decide what it wants. Uh, this has led to the current uh, uh, situation in the country. But speaking as a scholar and as an academic, what do you make of the whole situation? Uh. <laughs> Well, it's a total misconception that this has anything to do with Russian security. Uh, Ukraine was for a long time neutral under Kuchma, going, President Kuchma going back to the year, back to the 2000s. Uh, Ukraine was uh, officially called, billed itself as having a multi-vector policy. Uh, the uh, large majority of the public wanted to have normal relations with Russia. Well, why wouldn't they? Russia would be, you know, a major economic and trade partner. Ukraine is much smaller financially and in terms of population than Russia. So, of course, Ukraine uh, wouldn't want to antagonize uh, Russia and would have every interest in maintaining good relations with Russia. Uh, so the present con um, uh, conflict that comes from, you know, pure neo-colonialism and the uh, expansionist policy of uh, the government of Russia, Vladimir Putin. Uh, the, um, his uh, popularity back in two, prior to 2014 was uh, falling a little bit because uh, the economy, the oligarch-dominated economy was, you know, not performing well. People were grumbling. Uh, so he launched the um, annexation of Crimea, which was popular. So it gave him a boost, his, his career a boost. And from then, you know, a certain, you know, political dynamic then uh, continued. Uh, Russian propaganda, well, okay, they, they continue to sort of demonize and, uh, Ukraine. And uh, the tragic thing here is that the Russians believe their own propaganda. This is the bad thing. Uh, there's sort of, um, you know, no off-ramp here. Uh, Putin has sort of uh, made, him, uh, made himself a victim of his own propaganda. He has alleged uh, the oppression of Russians in Ukraine, uh, the suppression of the Russian language. All of this is untrue. Uh, he's now saving the Russians in Ukraine, so to speak. 
uh, he's invaded. Uh, he's gone in very deeply, and now there's no uh, no um, tactful way for him to pull out. Um, the Russian army made a big blunder here. You know, they're in Ukraine. That is, uh, they're taking heavy losses. Uh, but the government and Putin keep pushing forward. Uh, it's sort of, you know, they have a sort of a virtual Orwellian agenda. Uh, they want to, so to speak, denazify Ukraine, and nobody knows what that means. Apparently, it means removing all vestiges of Ukrainian language and cultural rights, uh, political rights, which is what they've been doing everywhere that they've occupied, in Crimea, in the Donbass, and in the areas they, that, they're, they're, that they occupied recently. Uh, they are arresting uh, scholars, uh, academics, journalists, clergy who are, you know, associate, you know, or you know, Ukrainian cultural figures. Uh, they're removing the Ukrainian and English languages from the curriculum. Uh, they're forcing uh, Russian into the school curriculum. Um, so the. the um, the cause of the war and the agenda is pure, well, adventurism and neocolonialism and the popularity of the Putin regime. Uh, but this is unfortunately very tightly bound up with uh, centuries-long mythologies that uh, most Russians have uh, about or against Ukraine. But then the Russians, the the uh, the, the the I don't know if it's a myth, but. The Russians uh, seem to be extremely strong on the ground, and even though you've referenced the fact that they've made a couple of mistakes uh, in, in, in invading uh, uh, Ukraine, it does, I mean, even from the reporting this morning, we hear that virtually all of uh, uh, Severodonetsk is now within their control, and that would then possibly give them a land corridor all the way to Crimea. So is, is, is it, do you think, time uh, for there to be some peace talks or an attempt at least to end the carnage while peace talks continue? Because the people who are bearing the brunt of this are those who actually live uh, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, peace would not bring security. Uh, in the areas of occupation, you know, there are at random, the, the, the soldiers are poorly trained soldiers, and they have the tacit agreement of the government to uh, abuse the population. Yet, oh, about a month or two ago, uh, when the uh, Russian forces were north in the country of Kiev, they were poorly supplied with food. And so Putin's government passed a, a law, that is a military law, allowing so-called self-sufficiency for the armed forces. What this meant is that individual you know, Russian soldiers could just go to villagers' homes and break in and take the food and, and, and you know anything else that they wanted, refrigerators, laptops, um, you know, and washing machines, refrigerators, laptops, and jewelry, anything that's handy. Uh, so you know, and that's systematic. But then, uh, does, so, does that uh, give you? Does that give you? Um, sorry, my apologies. Uh, uh, my apologies. Uh, my apologies. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Russia, Russia wouldn't hold. Well, they, they, okay, they've overextended themselves. The Russian army has overextended itself, and now it's it probably yeah now would like to have a ceasefire so as to um, you know be able to regroup its forces because it's kind of a contradictory or an ambiguous situation. Uh, the uh, Russian army um, occupies a lot of land, those territories that you mentioned. But its military situation is um, questionable and possibly, well, questionable. Uh, they have a high attrition rate. Their morale is low. Um, they, uh, the Ukrainians are waiting for uh, heavy Western mod uh, modern weapons to arrive. Some of these are now arriving at the front. And the Ukrainians think that in about a month when... Uh, more of the Western equipment um, arrives, uh, that they will be able to go on a counteroffensive, and uh, probably they would be successful. Well, at least partially successful. They will be able to drive back uh, the Russian forces, well, in selected places, perhaps in, well, um, yeah, in the South. That remains to be seen. 
Uh, but the Ukrainians are far from giving up. And incidentally, the angriest Ukrainians are those who uh, lost their homes uh, because of bombing and shelling. So uh, within Ukrainian society itself, uh, there's no mood for uh, a false peace. There's no mood for a, a surrender of any kind because they're convinced that, um, you know, Putin and Russia wouldn't keep their word anyway. Um, and I think this is true, that a peace would actually be more dangerous uh, than, than war. Um, I once, I recall once um, hearing a lecture by a German scholar stating that where she said that Stalin and Hitler killed more people during peacetime than during wartime. And if you read also this book by the um, American University professor Timothy Snyder called The Bloodlands, the area of Europe between Russia and Germany, uh, that's true. So um, peace, unfortunately, does not bring security. I must ask you, though, if, if, if you look at the wider situation, uh, it, you know, that not just the two major uh, people who are actually in combat, uh, that's Russia and Ukraine. You referenced it when you said that uh, uh, Ukraine is, not, is now about receiving heavy weapons uh, from the West, uh, Britain, from America, uh, from Germany, and so on. But then on the other side, Russia is not without its friends either. Russia is receiving uh, bulk payments as well from India. And then, of course, there's the big elephant, which is China. Uh, and which no one wants to face because of the same reason that, that we're trying to avoid direct confrontations with Russia. Now, those bigger players, uh, those other players who have been brought in, are they complicating the matter, do you think, uh, so that if and when there is even an attempt to resolve it, these other players will make that very difficult? Uh, well, yes, you make some very valid points, uh, yes. Um, certainly the war has, you know, ramifications be, be beyond the immediate area. Uh, this is ambiguous. Uh, <clears throat> I think both sides, both the Russian and the Ukrainian sides, uh, think they can win. Uh, so they're both, you know, um, still, I think, looking for a military solution. It's anybody's guess of how this will play out. Uh, Russia has, okay, Russia has lost, uh, the Russian army has lost a lot of its best officers and equipment, but they have enormous, um, and they can't replace that with new equipment because, uh, well, their military industrial complex is sort of in disarray, and also they uh, depend on Western or foreign uh, parts, components, and those are embargoed now. But they do have still enormous amounts of old Soviet equipment in reserve, uh, it's anybody's guess also what condition this equipment is, but I saw a figure of 13,000 tanks, uh, older ones, t uh, older non-modernized T-72s and T-64s and T-62s, <clears throat> even if only a quarter of them are operationalizable, uh, that's still 3,000 tanks. Uh, the bigger problem, the short-term problem anyway for Russia is that it actually doesn't have many reserves. It has on paper a reserve force of three, up uh, 900,000, but these are actually just a list on a sheet of paper. Uh, these reserves don't actually uh, you know, exist in barracks or collection points. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the Ukrainians have <coughs> uh, very many uh, people who are ready to volunteer. In fact, the problem for the Ukrainian side is they don't have enough weapons for the people who want to volunteer. Uh, the Ukrainian government mentioned they could raise, you know, a thousand reservists, a million reservists, which they probably could, but they don't have weapons. So the, the problems are kind of opposite. The Russians have the weapons, but not the personnel, and the Ukrainians have the personnel, but not so far the weapons. Uh, even when they do, the Ukrainians do get the, um, the uh, advanced weapons. It's still questionable uh, how these will actually perform. Uh, I've listened to some Ukrainian military exports, exports, and um, they would need probably three times the number of weapons that are actually being delivered. So uh, it's a very open question as to what impact uh, the uh, Western weapons will have. Uh, although it's safe to say, and again, as the uh, Ukrainian expert said, they have enough, the Ukrainians, to stop further Russian advance. Uh, 
it remains to be seen how much they'll be able to push the Russians back. Uh, that's in the short run. Over the long run, you know, Russia is a huge country. Uh, and if they did go to a general mobilization, well, they have 140, uh, 140 million people there. Um, then, you know, over the longer run, and if they can get, you know, uh, support from China and other places, well, then the Russian uh, position would be improved. Um, and of course, the Russians also are not standing still. Uh, they go to foreign countries where they, you know, where, to, where, to which they used to export uh, Soviet equipment or Russian equipment, and now they're trying to bring that back and spare parts. <clears throat> so uh, I can't, you know, I don't know how successful that is, but of course, that would be a logical thing for them to do. So, um, yes, the, the military situation, I think, is uh, still very much, um, you know, up in the air to, or to be speculated on. Well, uh, all of this, of course, plays to the fact that we expect that uh, so many uh, uh, so many days of conflict still lie ahead. It's not something that many people want to hear, but it does seem as if that is the realistic position on the ground. It's become a grinding war. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, the Ukrainians wouldn't be uh, attempting a counterattack until July, probably. They've, it keeps getting pushed back because these Western weapons, you know, are still en route somewhere, they're waiting and waiting, and they don't come, Germany blocks this. Um, so even if this um, counteroffensive, and again, as I said, it's an open question how successful it would be, but even if it is successful, it would start only in July, and, you know, obviously it takes several months at least, July, August, uh, October, uh, September, October, so, you know, for this to work through. So, yes, obviously we're looking for, you know, Opera, all uh, indications are for a long war. And of course, the Ukrainian population is suffering terribly. Their economy, you know, is, you know, their infrastructure is, you know, bombed out. Uh, so they're very dependent now on Western, both military and economic aid. And so uh, it seems to me that the war now from the Ukrainian side is not even so much in a military dimension, but in a sort of a uh, political and uh, diplomatic dimension. Uh, Ukraine's success or, success or failure militarily then depends on either the willingness or unwillingness of the Western countries to continue uh, to supply military and financial assistance. And, you know, as the war continues, there will be, you know, tiredness, you know, about this. Uh, so it's also been, then a very open question as to uh, how, if, uh, how long or if the Western consensus, such as it is, and it's not a complete consensus, uh, can be, will be for the support of Ukraine. So um, again, um, difficult lot, to, uh, to predict. Yeah, that. Lot, lots of, lots of uh, moving parts, lots of variables. Uh, uh, to consider there. But uh, Professor Dennis Soltis, thank you so much for your perspective and, uh, uh, and for your time uh, t today on uh, the program. Professor Soltis joins us uh, from Almaty in Kazakhstan. Thank you so much. That was my pleasure.